so the companies that we work with that I see really bring their retention up and bring turnover down um, are tapping into the, the human side of work. I'll go into a company and they'll say, you know, people aren't staying longer than three days. Then we'll start looking at what's your training strategy? How do people get onboarded? Who's their point person? Do they know who to go to? Do they know where to get with that person? Do they understand how they get credit for their work and if they're doing well and if they're being successful? If we're not providing training, pace setting, a point of connection, if, I'm, if I've been there a week and I haven't heard from my leader, um, I'm probably leaving. I don't necessarily find that retention is an issue of the work. I typically find that if you can unlock creating ways for leaders to have time to actually lead and to engage with people just by knowing their name and saying hi and checking in with them, um, your retention starts to go up. Hey, welcome to the Ops Leader Roundtable. We've got a very special guest today. We're joined by Karen Warren, who's Senior Manager at Joshua Tree Group. And we're really excited to talk about some of the work that Joshua Tree Group does in the warehouse and distribution space. A little bit about Karen's background and sort of her unorthodox route to the world of operations and warehousing and her broader views on what's going on in, in the space in the industry right now. So First, Karen, how's it going? Good. Summer going well for you so far? Yeah, it's been good. Our team's really busy. Um, supply, it's a great time to be in supply chain. It's a hard time to be in supply chain. So it's been fun just working with our clients and help them overcome their obstacles this year. Um, and yeah, summer's been great for us. How about you? Going pretty well. Can't complain. Uh, have a little trip to the beach in my near future. So looking forward to cooling off a little bit at the Jersey Shore. Um, but yeah, overall, you know, we're, we're staying busy here at Instawork, uh, lots of work to be done as we're a, a growing company. So, um, exciting times, uh, through now to, to the end of the year, but, um, you know, just wanted to kick things off. Tell me a little bit about what Joshua Tree Group does and kind of the work that you all specialize in. Yeah, great question. So Joshua Tree Group is a supply chain management consulting firm. Um, those are really common catchphrases and a lot of people still don't really know what that means. I think a lot of people are still learning what supply chain even means in general. Um, we specialize in labor and performance management. That's about 75% of our work with our clients. And so I like to tell people we're in the warehouse helping um, leaders, ops leaders, engineering, HR, all the way down to the floor associates design programs that enable them to um, recognize and reward the work their associates are doing um, to incentivize those associates, to drive leadership development, um, and to really put people more in control of their business in a continuous improvement way. So labor management is kind of our bread and butter. That's the lion's share of our work. Um, we also um, help companies in other ways with network strategy and design, figuring out where to put warehouses or if their warehouses are in the right place. Um, we help companies with um, selection of either 3PL partners or um, software um, because because we've seen so many solutions in the marketplace um, where we've grown this bench strength around saying, tell us what it is you need and let us help connect you to companies that can help meet that rather than just having to guess. So um, those are probably our top three service offerings. We also do things like facility design. We've got a large team of engineers that work for us in um, process optimization, process design, facility design. But um, those are kind of our, our top three. Okay. And I think, like I mentioned, you've got a bit of a, an untraditional path to this world. Yeah. Hoping you can tell me a little bit about your background and how you ended up in, in this consulting space. Yeah, uh, people often scratch their head when they start hearing about my background. Um, so I have a background in anthropology. Um, I went to school um, and didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I loved learning about how cultures are built and formed um, and how they change over time. That work, um, that learning, that education ended up taking me in the first part of my career into the nonprofit world. Um, so with the, um, kind of my early years out of school, I worked in anti-trafficking um, and donor engagement in the nonprofit space. Um, a lot of international development in that, um, some 
domestic development and education, um, some public speaking, but I really was working to help um, empower communities to have more resources today than they had yesterday in an effort to make them less vulnerable to human traffickers. Um, after the 2008 recession, um, nonprofits struggled um, because of um, people just did not have as much money to give charitably. So I ended up having um, the department I worked in closed at the nonprofit I was at with DC. Um, over the course of a few years transition, I kind of landed in a unique situation where um, somebody who'd done this consulting work before and who had an engineering degree um, had me on his team at another company in a different capacity and decided to go back into consulting and took me with him. Um, so I did an engineering apprenticeship, became an engineer, um, and have become a consultant, and I've been doing this for about 10 years now. Um, in that time, I've become an expert in labor and performance management. I've also gotten to serve as an operator um, with some of our clients when they have that need. Um, and so I've just landed in supply chain, and I love it. And I think that my anthropology background helps me every day because businesses are cultures, and we are change agents. And so we're still using the same tools and mechanisms that I did in nonprofit work to help guide people through change on a daily and weekly basis. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, where do you see the most crossover sort of between the, the cultural side of anthropology and, and the, the workplace dynamics of, you know, a warehouse? Yeah, um, I think the place where I see the most crossover is in the fact that culture hides itself from the people who are a part of it. So um, most people aren't aware of the nuances of their own culture. For example, um, Americans like to have an average of 29 inches between them and another person. Any closer than that, and they're probably uncomfortable. Um, warmer cultures or you know, Latin American cultures, that's a lot smaller. Um, but people aren't necessarily aware of that until you tell them that that is true. And then they're like, oh, it's kind of true. Businesses are the same way. Um, and so people don't see where they're kind of stuck in what they've always done or where um, they may not be aware of their sacred cows or um, the things they don't want to let go of that are keeping them from being successful and moving forward. Um, and so in that, that very true part about culture hiding itself from the people who are part of it is true in the businesses that we try to help change as well. You almost have to, often have to, show people what's true about the culture of their organization before you can change it because they don't have any awareness that it's even there. I mean, culture is something we talk a lot about with, with other folks in the warehouse space, you know, building a strong warehouse culture that, that increases retention, uh, helps you recruit more. You know, what do you see as, as being a few of the key best practices when it comes to building a, a warehouse culture that, that rewards workers who are doing a great job, but also, you know, is, is keeping them on board longer and bringing in new workers when needed? Yeah, um, good, great question. <laughs> um, I think that one of the one of the key things to rewarding individuals is maintaining the um, the perception of fairness. So we will help our clients design policies and procedures for their performance management programs. And one of the key factors, and this has been based on studies that date back to like the 40s and 50s, but over and over and over again, every single decade, new studies have been done and they're getting the same results, that the most important thing related to policy is that people perceive that the way that success is measured for them is fair related to how success is measured for someone else. Um, and so that's one of the most basic things that companies can do is however you are measuring success, create those metrics in a way that people are a part of them. People have total clarity on how and why that number exists and people believe in that metric. Um, and then be consistent with how you use and measure that to recognize, reward, hold people accountable. You're creating this culture then around something people believe in and that they perceive as fair because it is fair and you're consistently applying it to the entire population. Um, that's one of the most important things. If you're going to pay incentive or if you're going to give people feedback or if you potentially are going to hold somebody accountable related to their performance, they've really got to believe in where that number comes from as it's used across that whole spectrum. Yeah. Where have you seen this kind of work well and maybe an example where it wasn't done well just in terms of yeah things you observed 
that, that, um, uh, not done well is kind of the classic tendency of distribution um, retailers, um, warehouses in general, to have single variable rates for their performance metrics. Um, and so when we do our engineered labor standards um, for our clients and we are looking at all the different variables you can give somebody a credit for. So if you're familiar with warehousing um, operations, if you have somebody who's picking in a pick mod today in a single variable rate, they're probably getting credit for cases. How many cases can you do in an hour? And those um, expectations are usually based off of historic data or business needs. We will look at how many cases can you do in an hour of different case types? So large, heavy, small, um, light. How many cases can you do of different case types? How many locations are you visiting? Which is really how much are you traveling? Um, how many times do you have to scan? And so we build engineered standards where we say, you're not just going to get credit for cases anymore. You're going to get credit for case types. You're also going to get credit for pallets, locations, travel, having to change the zone. And as you do that, you're able to start saying, this work accurately reflects the effort required to do the job. Because if my large, if I'm doing more large cases, as I'm throwing 50 pound boxes of bleach, I can do fewer of those than throwing a six ounce case of foil balloons. I've seen companies give those two jobs the same exact case per hour rate when the effort required to do the work is totally different. And so um, the kind of traditional rate system that's still used in most companies is where I would say it's not as effective. <laughs> um, and then looking at all the different types of work somebody can do and finding creative ways to give them credit for those variables um, is where it starts to become more effective. You know, what are some other sorts of incentives or strategies that you see successful warehouse operators using when it comes to keeping retention rates higher. I mean, I, I know when we talk to customers, we hear all the time, you know, they're bringing people in, they're going through the process of a full-time hire, um, sometimes, you know, four or five in a go, and then only one to two might stay, you know, through a three month period. So from a retention perspective, what's working with clients that you, that you see? Being successful. Retention and turnover are like the topics everybody wants to talk about. Um, and I've kind of seen um, in my time doing this, and as you learn more about the marketplace, you know they've been doing it for decades. People are just repack, they're talking about engagement, they're repackaging it. It's the same stuff every couple of years, hoping that kind of a repackage on engagement will bring enough energy to engage people. Um, and and I don't think we're getting different results. I think we're seeing it actually just get worse over time. Um, so the companies that we work with that I see really bring their retention up and bring turnover down um, are tapping into the, the human side of work. Um, so um, I'll, I'll go into a company and they'll say, you know, people aren't staying longer than three days. Um, they're walking out in the middle of shifts and we'll start looking at what's your training strategy? How do people get onboarded? Um, do they have who's their point person? If they've got a question on their first day, do they know who to go to? Do they know where to get with that person? Um, when's the first time they hear from their leader? Um, and uh, do they understand how they get credit for their work and if they're doing well and if they're being successful? Um, it's the same. It's the same with warehousing work as it is with my consulting job. I want to know if I'm doing well as a human. I think most people desire to to do well. Um, and so, if we're not providing any of that, if we're not providing training. Um, pace setting, a point of connection. If, I'm, if I've been there a week and I haven't heard from my leader, um, I'm probably leaving. Um, and so I don't necessarily find that retention is an issue of the work. The work is hard. Um, and and there's, there's no doubt about it. Some people don't want to do the work. Um, but I, t I typically find that if you can unlock creating ways for leaders to have time to actually lead 
and to engage with people just by knowing their name and saying hi and checking in with them, um, your retention starts to go up. Um, it's a lot more about the people side and that culture side um, for, for in my experience than it is about uh, pay matters. Pay certainly matters. You've got to be paying enough to get invited to the dance. Um, but it's a, it's a lot about the people side, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned having a strong onboarding process, you know, making sure that leadership is is meeting with new recruits when they're coming in the door and they have better expectations that way. Um, you know, a question we get a lot is how do you bridge that balance when it comes to, you know, and that, on that side, we're talking about full-time workers, but obviously as we're getting closer to Q4, starting to think about bringing in temps or flex workers like in-store is bringing to the table, you know, how do you sort of repeat that onboarding strategy when you might be getting brand new workers who, who, Maybe a, a manager doesn't feel like they should be putting in that time to, to onboard them appropriately if they're really just a, a temp worker for a limited time period. How do you onboard temp workers just as effectively as you do a full-time employee? Yeah, good question. And it is a tough one um, because you're, you're bringing those temps in at the time when your business is the hardest to manage. And so um, where you might be able to say, you know, if, you, if, you're, a C, if you're a company that has your peak in in the winter during the holidays it's a lot easier to say go do these things that are you know more qualitative and softer side in april when you're not in the middle of peak um and so i think there's a couple of things one be strategic about where you put temps. Um, a lot of companies do this well. They recognize they've got to put them in operations that have less system interaction or um, that are easier to learn. Um, something like just a, a straight induction is a lot easier for somebody to learn than like an overpack, break pack operation or um, shipping and receiving or where they put a lot of people roles that can be called lumping, um, where you're moving cases. And so I think that's appropriate, finding roles where people can quickly become successful. Um, but one thing that I've helped companies implement is just doesn't always have to be the leader who um, can take that time. Who are the people, who are the cultural juggernauts of your team who you're willing to say, I want you to take 5% of your time to check in with temps and you can go off standard. Here's how we're going to recognize and reward you for that as a exemplary performer during peak is to say you you're a part of our engagement strategy. You're going to have three temps in the same work area as you today. You're going to be their point person. And so it doesn't always have to be the leader. You can trust some people with that. But then you want to set clear expectations around what that looks like, how much time they should be spending doing it, um, and removing any obstacles that keep them from being productive in the business as well. Um, but I think I think you can use your team. I think you can invite people into the process of engagement. The person I'm picking on the other side of a conveyor from is actually probably more impactful to me as a temp than the leader that I see once a day. Um, and so just having that team culture where we know we need to be able to stop, correct, train, and then get back to work um, during those peak seasons, I think is how you keep a temp. Yeah. I mean, certainly going back to the idea of setting a culture, right? We, we had a discussion with cart.com, who's a customer of ours uh, based in the Austin area recently. And he talked about just the importance of, you know, something as small as having the same snacks and, and uh, yeah. you know, break options for temps as you do for full-time employees. And um, at least when we've seen using flex work or, or temp work be most successful is when companies are really embracing the workers as part of their workforce and, and bringing yeah. them in as, as part of their family. Um, you know, recently had a chance to go out to a partner in the DC area and was amazing to see how an in-store professional was, you know, working some of the, the input systems uh, for orders that were going out. And he'd been there for over a year, just um, really wanting to embrace the the flexibility of what a platform like Instawork or flexible work can provide. Yeah. Um, but the, the customer was able to really bring them in and make them part of the, uh, make them a key part of their operations rather than, you know, always just sticking them with say pick and packing uh, positions, but, you know, really making them part of their operations on a daily basis. 
Yeah. You know, it's interesting. We try to practice what we preach. Obviously, um, we bring interns in and in the t- interns are, t- are temp work. Right. <laughs> um, and uh, we tell our interns that if you're going to come onto our team, you're part of our team. We're treating you just like a full time consultant for the summer. Um, and then we do. We put them on the project and they're there. They're contributing the same way. They're learning the same stuff. Um, and I think it's it's the same as what you're talking about. Just really want that person to be there. They're not outsourced robots. They're still people. Um, and um, to your point, it's the small stuff. It's usually not big strategies that make the biggest difference. It's just inviting people in to the goal of the business. But looking ahead to the Q4 peak, like you mentioned, I mean, what are you guys hearing about the labor market right now as it relates to warehouse work? Um, at least from our perspective, it seems to be easing up a little bit on on some of our customers. It's not quite as hard to hire full-time as it was a year ago, but obviously going into Q4, major ramp up period, you know, what are you hearing from from your customers and clients as it relates to hiring and, and challenges there still? Yeah, we've got, I think those challenges are still pretty heavy. I think they might be different, but they're still really heavy. Um, we've got a lot of clients wanting to, even now, like the summer is our peak in consulting. People want to finish their projects before they're going to be in their peak. Um, We still have clients reaching out to us now in July, wanting to get performance management in to their building before peak to alleviate their labor need, um, to get things more efficient, to get people more engaged, to incentivize their existing workforce and uh, help people want to give more discretionary effort to the work um, because they're they're concerned they're not going to be able to staff up during peak. Um, we're seeing that the most in um, areas where there's either not a lot of population available or where there's a really high saturation of companies competing for the labor. Um, so Memphis, um, all, all those like hubs where you've got every business has a distribution center there. Um, so we're, we're seeing our clients um probably have a higher level of urgency this year related to getting performance management in. So they've got better metrics and better tools available to them to know exactly what they need for peak rather than guessing and potentially not being able to get it. Um, A lot of people are looking for good temp partners, um, people that have a a good culture to plug in rather than just plug and play. If that person's not performing they call and just get them out of here. Don't bring them back. They're looking for good partners. Um, they're looking to have better tools and they're um, just as concerned in my, in my experience, what I'm seeing just as concerned with that urgency around what they're going to need this year as they have been in the last few years in particular. Yeah. How, how are they thinking about volumes for Q4? Do they expect it to be even higher than, than last year? Um, the companies that I'm with right now are, so we're with a lot of grocery right now. Um, and, you know, grocery, feast, COVID was feast or famine for people. Um, our um, Some of our clients were calling us going, how do I stay essential? Um, so I can stay open. Other, uh, our grocery clients were calling us and going, our volume has peaked 50% literally overnight. We can't get through the volume. We need help. So it was feast or famine. Um, this year, I'm experiencing a lot more people feeling uncertain about what's going to happen with peak. And I think that uncertainty is coming from inflation and budgets being tighter. And are we really going to see people wanting to spend as much as they did last year when they hadn't spent in two years and they were, you know, finally out of the house and getting back to family holidays and um, people were willing to spend more, I think, with where the economy is at, where um, the globe is at. Um, People are a little more hesitant to do that this year. And um, I'm seeing most of my clients think that it's going to be a heavy peak, but they're having a lot less confidence in that planning. Yeah, it makes sense. A lot of a lot of uncertainty, a lot of yeah. demand shifting around between goods and services and not quite knowing where it's going to settle quite yet. Yeah. You know, obviously some some fears of a potential recession, maybe a little less than a month ago. But, um, you know, we hear the same thing. People are just not quite sure what sort of inventory, inventory levels of stock and then, you know, the labor that's going to be needed to, to get it out the door. So, um now, one thing I wanted to, to kind of end on and, and ask you about that I found really interesting when we met before was, you know, the fact that Joshua Tree Group actually owns a, a warehouse or a 3PL themselves. And you guys have some really interesting strategies when it comes to 
uh, recruitment, you know, maybe thinking outside the box a little bit when it comes to where to find workers. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So we do have a kind of co-affiliated organization um, that is a 3PL um, and we're in, it's in Nashville. It's in a really pretty highly saturated market for labor. Um, And so, um, you know, it kind of starts back a few years ago in 2020, we were working with a client out of Chicago who um, their peak is like four really brutal weeks between Thanksgiving and Christmas, they do um, more in a day during that time frame than they do in a week any other time of the year. And so um, they had trouble in Chicago staffing that um, massive distribution hub um, in Chicago. And so they were going, who's available during the winter that we haven't talked to yet about work? And they landed on landscapers and pavers. They can't work with all that snow out. So um, that's who they staff up. And I remember just being so impressed by this organization and their creativity that we started looking for other ways to be innovative around looking for non-traditional sources for labor. Um, As we have worked with our clients since then and started our own 3PL, we've just really embraced that. Um, And so one of the places that we have looked is at the refugee population. Um, You have about 144,000 Afghan refugees that were here last year whose resettlement support has ended or is ending and they're getting their work authorizations and they're looking for jobs. Um, And so um, we're also going to have millions of displaced Ukrainians. Um, And we have a consistent flow of refugees coming into the country from other from other areas of the world. Um, And so um, that's one kind of non-traditional population or non-traditional labor source that people can look at. Um, We also have looked at special people with special needs or um, disabilities who have a hard time finding a place to fit and be consistent um, with their work. Um, And then also you can look at um, partnering with nonprofits or organizations that do rehabilitation for people transitioning out of drug addiction, incarceration, abuse, trafficking. Um, So close to my heart, it's incredible now to be able to bring that into this work. Um, So I I think looking at non-traditional labor sources is a place where there's still a ton of opportunity to be even more creative than we have been in the marketplace. Those labor sources come with unique obstacles of their own. Um, And so I don't know that I would recommend staffing your entire operation from one of those. You know, there could be language challenges. There are cultural differences. There are, um, you know, if you're, if you're looking at including people with special needs and disabilities, um, you may need to say, what kind of operations do we need to design to be a right fit for this person? Um, But we we have found in a place where we've been really successful um, with our staffing strategy is that the level of retention for those populations are high. The um, no call, no show rate is very low. The, um, the appetite for partnering and collaborating to meet those unique needs related to um, language and things like that is high. They want to collaborate in such a way um, to solve to solve some of those unique barriers, um, and and they're really committed to the work and high performers. Um, and so we've gotten really creative. We're working with a network of nonprofits. We're working with a network of um, refugee settlement support, um, and we have just an incredible team. And in our warehouse who um, are there every day and and want to contribute um, and ask a lot of questions and bring ideas and want to collaborate because they, um, they're they just so grateful to have a place to land. Um, and so I think that there's some more creativity that can exist in the marketplace around getting creative and looking places where we have not looked yet um, for options for employment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we work also in the hospitality space where they've coming out of COVID lost almost 30% of the hospitality workforce, Um, you know, maybe warehousing and and supply chain hasn't been hit quite that bad in terms of drop off, but, you know, they've really had to dig deep on where they can find workers for catering services, for uh, working at stadiums and, you know, going so far as to tap the local fire stations for, for folks who 
you know, might have some downtime and could pick up a shift on the weekend. Mm-hmm. But, you know, this time and, and the labor shortage over the last few years has really forced businesses to to think in new ways and to to open their mind to workers that, that might not have come in their door before. So, um, you know, really interesting to hear you guys tapping into some different populations and um, also doing some really good social good while you're at it, uh, you know, bringing people in in that way. So, um, you know, I feel like we could keep this going for another yeah. hour or so, but I do want to kind of wrap things up. Uh, you know, Karen Warren here from Joshua Tree Group. Thanks so much again for, for taking part in the Ops Leader Roundtable. Um, and, you know, maybe we'll do a part two in, in the next c- couple months. That'd be awesome. Thanks for having me. This is great. All right. Thanks. Thanks.